It's undeniable that Shigeru Miyamoto has forever changed the landscape of gaming. He's the creator of some of the most critically acclaimed and best-selling franchises in existence, and yet that wasn't always the case. In fact, Miyamoto's first choice wasn't to have a career in video games. He wanted to be a manga artist. That's right, a manga artist. Miyamoto is a full-fledged weeaboomer. You heard it here first, people. If you've ever wondered how this juggernaut of video game history came to be, where his ideas came from, or how life can take you on a path that you least expected, then sit back and listen to the story of how a man completely unversed in gaming became one of its founding fathers. <laughs> I've always had an interest in the beginning of great things, and great people are no exception to that. The first time I ever saw Miyamoto in person was at E3. And when I say saw, I mean saw from afar. I definitely didn't get a chance to meet the guy because Nintendo had him surrounded by all these secret service style dudes in suits. He was like standing in the middle of a dozen guys who were all in a diamond formation with earpieces. And I kept expecting one of them to hop to the side and be like, the dude is that important. Ever since that small encounter, I've always wondered how he's gotten to the point in his career where he's treated like the dictator of a small nation visiting foreign soil. And the answer isn't quite what you'd expect. Miyamoto was born in the town of Sonobi, a small rural town to the northwest of Kyoto, an area of Japan known for its traditional historic roots. And remember, this is in 1952. No computers, no cell phones, no video games. We're basically talking about another planet compared to now. For reference, Pong was released in 1972, Pac-Man in 1980. Our little Shigeru didn't have anything to entertain him like we do today. And when you have nothing to do, your parents parents kick you outside so you'll stop bugging them. And it was the outdoors that gave Miyamoto the inspiration to make generations of gamers stay indoors. At a young age, Miyamoto began to explore the surrounding natural areas of his home. On one of these expeditions, he came upon a cave and after multiple days of hesitation, he finally went inside, which eventually led to more cave expeditions. These old memories of exploring caves near his childhood home became the initial influence for The Legend of Zelda. Making a game that's essentially exploring caves to see what's inside has has become one of the top selling Nintendo franchises. It's a unique mind that can take something so ordinary, something that thousands of people have done, and see the massive potential that a simple idea can unleash. Once Miyamoto grew up, he went to Kanazawa Municipal College of Industrial Arts. He graduated with a degree in industrial design and much like many college graduates today, never used that degree. He had no job lined up after graduation and he wanted to draw manga. And while we might laugh, this desire to draw manga might be the most important reason we play the video games that we do today. Miyamoto was influenced by manga's classical Kisho Tenketsu narrative structure, which is essentially a four act breakdown to the plot. Introduction, development, twist, conclusion. It's often used in manga and Chinese poetry, but Miyamoto revolutionized the idea by slapping it in video games. Here's a simple breakdown of the parts. In the introduction, you introduce the characters, the time period if necessary, and other important knowledge to understand the story. Development is straightforward. Characters progress on a fairly linear path to the twist. The twist is the climax. Something unexpected happens. It's the crux of the story, and of all the turns the narrative can take, this is the biggest. And the conclusion just wraps it up. If you look at a lot of Mario games, like Super Mario Galaxy or Super Mario 3D World, they use this structure. You can also see this in a lot of boss levels throughout gaming. The boss is introduced to you at the beginning of the level as the introduction. You progress through the level to the boss fight, or you progress through the boss fight until the twist. A second stage, or something you didn't know was going to happen happens, shakes up the gameplay. Then you beat the boss and get your conclusion. When Space Invaders released, it inspired Miyamoto to get into the gaming sphere, and he brought along the idea of giving a game a story. However, he didn't just walk into the Nintendo offices and start designing games. At the time, Nintendo was a relatively small company that primarily sold playing cards. In the 1960s, they began to branch into toys and games. Now, you'd expect to hear a story of Miyamoto just going on in and blowing the Nintendo execs away with his creations. 
But in reality, he needed help to just get an interview. His father was able to ask a friend for help, and thanks to that friend, Miyamoto was granted an interview with the president at the time, Hiroshi Yamauchi. Just goes to show that whether it's 2020 or 1977, getting a job is more about who you know than what you know. And further success is based off of how you approach the job once you get it. So take note and use those connections that you got, people. Miyamoto showed Yamauchi some of his toy creations and was hired on as an apprentice in the planning department before eventually becoming the company's first artist. He went on to do the art for Nintendo's first coin-operated arcade cabinet, Sheriff, in 1979. So he worked with Nintendo for two years before even touching a video game. And when he did, it was only to do the artwork. However, the next year, he helped develop their second arcade game, Radar Scope, which essentially looked like a less daunting and faster version of Space Invaders. Unsurprisingly, Radar Scope was unable to break into the Western market, leaving Nintendo with a hole in their pocket of unsold cabinets and putting them on the verge of financial collapse. In times of adversity, people will either fold or rise to the task. And this is where Miyamoto's spark turned into a fire. In this dire situation, Nintendo's best bet was to take the unsold unit of Radar Scope and convert them to a new game. And whatever that new game was, had to sell. Otherwise, it was curtains. Miyamoto, more like Mia No Go. Got he! <laughs> Woo! That's a joke. So, Nintendo was very close to folding. Yamauchi gave the task of creating a new game to Miyamoto, but not out of faith or respect. In Miyamoto's own words, he was given the job because, quote, no one else was available. Can you imagine being given the job of creating a brand new game for all these unsold cabinets? Oh, and you need to do it because everybody else is busy. So good luck. Oh, and by the way, the company might go bankrupt if you don't succeed. So have fun. Yeah, sounds terrible. Miyamoto had a ton of different ideas, but settled on a love triangle between a carpenter, gorilla, and a girl. This, of course, became Donkey Kong. The original intention was to make the cabinet comic book characters, specifically Popeye, Bluto, and Olive Oil. Like, no joke, Mario was supposed to be Popeye, but Nintendo failed to gain the rights to Popeye, so Bluto turned into Donkey Kong. Olive oil turned into Pauline, and Popeye became an overweight carpenter with a mustache. Miyamoto has also mentioned King Kong and Beauty and the Beast as influences for his business casual gorilla. And so, Donkey Kong revolutionized gaming. It's credited as the first video game to have a plot. And sure, that plot was pretty short and really stupid, but it was there. And having a story gives people a connection to the characters. It's not surprising you can find more to relate to with Donkey Kong than Space Invaders. A small story is better than nothing. Donkey Kong's success led to Miyamoto working on Donkey Kong Jr. and Donkey Kong 3, both maintaining the idea of small plots within the games, which ultimately led into the birth of the Mario Brothers. Miyamoto reworked Jumpman into Mario, made his green color twin brother Luigi, gave them a New York sewer setting, and BOOM! Mario Bros was born, which has now been released on more than a dozen platforms. These arcade cabinets really put Miyamoto on the map as a game designer. He couldn't do the actual development himself, but his ideas were working, and they'd continue to work even more in the home market. When the Family Computer and NES released, Miyamoto made the two arguably most influential titles in all of gaming. Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda. In both games, Miyamoto focused more on gameplay and story than high scores, something extremely new considering the previous gaming era was dominated by arcade machines. But Miyamoto created the two paths we see games take, linear and non-linear. Mario is obviously a linear side-scrolling platformer, Legend of Zelda is non-linear forcing the player to think through puzzles and explore. With Zelda, no one had ever seen a world so massive in a video game at the time. It was an eye-opening experience of what games could become, and every non-linear game to date can trace its origins back to The Legend of Zelda. And Zelda was realized by Miyamoto's childhood of exploring outdoors. To quote him, When I traveled around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, 
I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. They say we learn from experience and the proof is in the gaming pudding. Oh, I could continue and talk for days about Miyamoto's work on 3D games for the N64 and how Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time both revolutionized gaming yet again, how he guided the design of the SNES and N64 controllers, went on to produce the GameCube's launch title Luigi's Mansion and more, but in terms of his rise, it was cemented in stone when the home console market began. If it wasn't for him, it's possible that arcades may still be a lot more relevant today. His ideas for stories and games revolutionized the idea of what a game could be. At home, you aren't constrained by time limits or money or some pissed off dude standing behind you waiting for his turn. You can spend 120 hours playing Xenoblade at your leisure if you wanted to. It's just something an arcade can't give you. Not only that, but the man paved the way for future visionaries like Hideo Kojima to further bridge the gap between video games and other entertainment like movies and novels. Miyamoto is still a lead designer and producer at Nintendo, as well as one of Nintendo's representative directors. And it all began not just from a desire to create, but to create something completely different. I see Miyamoto's story as not just a success story, but one that takes aspects of something you love, in this case, the stories of manga, and introduces them to a new medium, video games that didn't have them before. Bringing stories into games is perhaps the largest legacy anyone could ever leave. And it's all thanks to one man who spent his life exploring and wanted to make manga art. None of us know where we're gonna end up in life, but if you can take anything from Miyamoto's story, it's that the things you enjoy can be relevant in any field if you're willing to think outside the box. But seriously, can you imagine if Donkey Kong became a Popeye game? The entire gaming landscape would have changed. There's an alternate dimension out there where we have Popeye 64 and Paper Popeye. But in this dimension, make sure to check out our Nintendo playlists where you'll be sure to learn something new about Mario and everything Nintendo. Thanks for watching this deep dive into a gaming legend. My name is Ryan from Tree School, and I'll see you all next time. Toodles!